Well, first, um, we have to define what enlightenment is. Because there's plenty of enlightened people out there in the world right now. The problem is um, a lot of enlightened people know a lot, understand a lot, have realized a lot, but are essentially ineffective at doing anything with their enlightenment. So enlightenment is a fairly easy thing to accomplish. Um, the hardest part is taking that enlightenment and then fulfilling some kind of universal purpose with it. So one problem that we've seen is that uh, many people, well-meaning people, very spiritual people, wonderful people, get into some kind of a process of meditation or spiritual discipline, and they spend a lot of time working on their enlightenment, and they get very up there. And when they come back down from there, wherever that there is, they're still a mess. Their lives are still a mess. Their relationships are still a mess. They still have the same old emotions and problems and so on and so forth. So from our perspective now, we've worked a lot on looking at what enlightenment really is. And enlightenment really is becoming grounded <laughs> more than anything. So how I would, you know, and what we do now in terms of how would you suggest somebody go about in that pursuit? Well, the, the first thing is to get grounded. Make sure you're physically healthy and emotionally healthy, which most people want to avoid. They want to go straight to God. I don't want to deal with any of this human stuff because I'm not human anyway. But that usually doesn't work. And most people, if they're honest, will attest to that. They'll say, I've been meditating for 30 years and I'm still a disaster. I still don't make enough money. I still have a relationship problem and so on. So, so really the, the ability to integrate all parts of ourself is what I believe enlightenment really is. So how do you do that? Well, um, neurofeedback is our primary tool in terms of breaking up some of those human patterns that we get stuck in. And then we use Qigong because Qigong um, is one of the best sciences really that teaches you how to stay grounded, how to achieve this really remarkable health that's possible for every one of us if you learn what she is and that it is the essence of your life force and so on. So those two things um, combined serve to really create an alchemy within the body to where it is transformed, where it's refined. Then meditation, I think, can't be left out and a higher form of meditation where you are really accessing what we call heaven energy, where you are accessing what we call divine grace, where you are really touching that source of the universe. But you can't touch that and drop back down and maintain it. At least most of us can't. You have to learn how to do that. And that means learning how to touch it, but then at the same time how to ground it. And again, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We're just transmission towers. The human body is a transmission tower for universal energy. From way up there down to here, we are this conduit for this energy to flow through the universe. So I think enlightenment is really recognizing that and then fulfilling that process. Again, most people think enlightenment is just going up and out. I'm not this body. I'm not this physical body. I don't know what I'm doing here. I want to get out of here. I don't want to come back again. It's escape. Really to embrace the physical reality, to embrace our role here on this planet I, from what I've gleaned thus far in this lifetime is really what it's all about. And when then you embrace that and you, you discover that that's really what you're doing here, then enlightenment takes on a whole different perspective. And then you start to actualize a whole lot more of the potential that's really there.
Well, using using neurofeedback has um, already been documented, researched that it um, increases cognitive abilities. One research study showed that it uh, raised IQ points uh, by as many as 15 points with kids with ADD and ADHD and learning disabilities. Uh, there's studies being done now on Alzheimer's uh, using neurofeedback. Um, it's a lot of it's being touted as uh, the peak performance model or optimal performance model. But again, it's very simple. Um, if you engage the brain in a process that helps it organize its electrical function and work correctly, it has more access to the information that's already in there. I think, by and large, you don't actually raise somebody's IQ, make them smarter. You don't give them any more information. You just simply improve the efficiency of the way the brain works, increase its ability to access the information that's already in there, then to sequence that information. Um, and that's, by and large, what the training does. Then you see things like IQs going up. You see people thinking better, functioning better, being sharper, more focused, and so on. All these things are trainable. I mean, you, we know what focus is, what real attention and concentration is. So we know what it is from a neurological perspective. Unfortunately, right now in the U.S., we're trying to use pharmaceuticals to influence that. Unfortunately, there's a lot of side effects with that, but there's an EEG of concentration. There's an EEG of focus. There's an EEG of enlightenment. But we have those templates, so it's as simple as saying, look, this is what it means in your EEG when your brain is focused, when you are cognitively sharp as a tack. You just teach it. It's like any skill. The brain will learn it quickly. This is tough right now because I just, you should see the email I got today. We had a, a former patient who's a physician, a, a emergency room physician. I treated her and her children. And she went to California where, quote unquote, the best neurofeedback practitioner should be. And she sent us back this email. She went to three people who not only did she feel like they didn't know what they were doing, she felt they were dishonest and one guy was neurotic and one, they did a session, screwed them all up and so on. So this is a really hard part. That's why I'm training people. There's thousands of people out there doing this now, but there's not hardly anybody who really understands the potency. And what I'm saying now, if you were to show this, they'd be like, what is he talking about? Higher consciousness and neurofeedback from 99% of the clinicians out there now are two alien things. You're hearing a very unique perspective right now. The whole reason I've been trying to teach people how to do this correctly. From my perspective, most clinicians are using neurofeedback like, like using a laser beam for a flashlight. They're way off the mark. Yeah, it helps them do a few things, but way, way beneath the potential. So I can't say, yeah, go find your local practitioner because it <laughs> may not be worth it you know, a damn right now, so. There's a lot of neurofeedback de devices on the market, a lot of equipment on the market. Um, you get what you pay for in this field, so equipment that you buy for under $1,000 is not going to be as optimal as equipment that you might buy for $3,000. Um, I do not recommend that people get on the internet and just go buy equipment without sufficient training because you can do the wrong thing. Um, it's been known to happen. So you do need training and guidance and supervision and so on to go through the process. It's not a toy for sure. It's a very powerful uh, therapeutic device. So and sometimes, um, you know, people will read a book and say, I need more alpha is what this book says because alpha means this and this and this. And then they put electrodes on their head and they say, okay, computer, tell me when I do alpha. And then all of a sudden they have a panic attack or a migraine headache or get irritable bowel syndrome because that person probably didn't need alpha. And the only way you can determine that is if you know what you're looking at and what you're looking for. So these are all really important aspects of this. Um, so if people are interested in it, uh, do some research 
And if they are looking at neurofeedback from the perspective of enlightenment, then find somebody who specifically does that. Um, and use, you know, use discernment. Um, there are clinicians out there who are strictly doing neurofeedback for attention deficit disorder, and that's fine. And uh, sometimes you'll achieve, you know, wonderful cognitive uh, benefits just by going to them. But for the most part, um, you usually need a good practitioner to begin with before you go out and buy your own equipment and start hooking yourself up. Well, it's a good, it's a good, Anna's, Anna Weiss's device, I mean, it's a good measure, um, but it's not a feedback device. And, you know, I'm real familiar with Anna's work and actually more familiar with Katie, her guru, Maxwell. Um, it's a good measurement tool, but it's not a feedback device. And um, I'm frankly, uh, I wish, I should say, that, that um, Anna would get into feedback because she could do a whole lot more benefit and achieve a whole lot more results if she started employing feedback. They just use mind mirror to identify states. Then she teaches visualization and different techniques to getting to those states. Um, again, from a feedback perspective, you know, with the technology we have now, you can bypass a lot of teaching, training, practice by saying, look, there's the state. When you hear that sound, that's it. Okay, rather than, okay, let's sit here and see if we're doing it. It's not real time. Yeah, it's, it's a retrospective thing. Oh, am I there now? Oh, not quite. Okay, let me try again. Oh, am I there? Not quite. Versus, beep, you're there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the mind mirror is really, um, and was originally designed as a, a measurement device, not as a feedback device. Although now, you know, people are obviously seeing the, the benefits of it and are modifying it to actually be a feedback device. So what would I do if somebody came to me who was an addict? Um, first thing we do is, uh, is an, a fairly thorough uh, EEG, quantitative EEG analysis, look at their EEG and um, determine where their brain's working right and where their brain's not working right. So the first thing is, uh, is really um, pinpointing the specific problem in the EEG. And really, the remarkable thing about the EEG is that it is a signature and it will tell you a lot about a person. It will tell you if this person's depressed, if this person's anxious. Um, it, with current research, current technology now, we can even tell if somebody has repressed memories, if somebody's been traumatized as a child, if somebody is um, suppressing a tremendous amount of emotional energy. You can see all these things in the EEG. You can see if they're hypervigilant, if they have post-traumatic stress disorder, and on and on and on. Because often those are all comorbid factors in addiction. There may be a history of abuse, uh, physical, emotional, sexual. There may be what we would call attention deficit disorder markers. Uh, there may be post-traumatic stress disorder markers and so on. So we, we identify all these issues in the EEG and then see if they actually correlate with what the person's reporting. So we gather all that information and then from there we determine the appropriate um, hierarchy. What are we going to treat first? Uh, do you have this limbic system that's totally out of whack? In other words, are you constantly being triggered by that fight or flight response. And if you are, we need to turn that off because the constant triggering of the fight or flight response is basically dumping a ton of chemicals into your system. Therefore, you're craving some kind of drug or substance or behavior from the outside. That's what's at the root of addiction. So often, those are some of the first things we have to work on. Repressed memories, uh, an overactive fight or flight response. Um, attentional issues and so on. On top of all that, um, of course, we look at, you know, how toxic is the body? Do we have to detoxify this body? Do we have to uh, 
fix the liver because the liver is really the ruling organ as far as a person's neurotransmitters go. And if the liver has been compromised by alcohol or drugs or something else, it's probably not making the correct enzymes. It's probably not activating the correct processes that would give that person the appropriate neurotransmitter level so they weren't running around looking for drugs and craving. So we have to really make sure the liver is working okay, it's detoxified, and then it's receiving the appropriate supplements, amino acids, herbs, and so on, to where it's supported. And we also have to um, look at the personality type, too. We are users and big believers in the Enneagram, the nine personality types. Not that we want to label and stereotype each person into a particular type, but there are true tendencies that you can identify in people. And these nine types really show you a lot about somebody, that we are not one species like dogs. We have different species among us, among human beings. And that you have to see, well, this particular addict sees life and the world and themselves from an entirely different perspective. And so we, we, I think it's really important to identify that, that that's an important part of it. Making a person aware of what their personality type is and what they probably need to do to work through their issues. Because that's empowering. The whole point behind addiction is empowering the person, not fixing them, not healing them, but giving them the tools and the knowledge where they can heal themselves. So first the EEG, repairing that, then the liver, getting the liver working right, the right neurotransmitters, and then really arming the person with knowledge about themselves that they can begin to use. And then of course the, the spiritual part is, is primary, and we always weave that in. The, you know, just, just, I think one of the most powerful things uh, an addict um, eventually comes to, and you know, this is in the 12 steps, is the spiritual awakening, that that really is key. Um, and spiritual awakening can be facilitated um, by simply offering to the addict, you know, uh, a spiritual way of looking at themselves and at life. And if a spiritual awakening can happen, it also produces this whole change in the brain and in the chemistry and so on. So really, um, the approach is, to, is multifaceted, um, you know, from the perspective of the brain, very objective, and then from the perspective of the body's physiology, and then from the perspective of how that person's personality is either destroying them or how it can save them. And then obviously from the perspective of their spirituality. So really in, in terms of treating addiction, our experience has been that you have to incorporate all of that. If you leave anyone out, you're going to fall short somewhere along the line. But if you can really address each one of those areas um, at the same time, you can have really profound results fairly quickly. We have, um, by and large, uh, destroyed, uh, you know, the, um, the vitamin and mineral content of most of the food that we're eating now. And if our bodies are not getting these essential components, they're not going to make the right neurotransmitters. Many of us are suffering from um, vi hidden viruses and yeasts and molds and so on and so forth that have, uh, you know, um, found a wonderful place to live in within our bodies because of all the antibiotics that have been overused and then the cows and the animals that have been given the antibiotics and so on. So I think really our physiology right now is a mess. It's, it's a disaster. And so we're not getting the right nutrients and we are probably riddled with a lot of um, bacteria and viruses that don't need to be there and that are affecting us at, quite adversely. So, and on top of all that, every individual has a very genetic body type and a very specific diet that is genetically appropriate for them. Not everyone should eat meat, but some people should eat meat. Not everyone uh, 
should eat a carbohydrate free diet but some people do need to so all genetically determined not there's no stereotypical things here so these are things we try to do how do you identify what a person's number one genetic type is and that's not hard I mean northern european or african or american indian or whatever and it's real clear what kind of foods you are genetically designed to live on and then you just simply gear or guide a person towards those but we're we're also huge believers in this thing about neurotransmitter um, supplementation if you if the body isn't getting the appropriate levels of amino acids or not metabolizing amino acids and essential fatty acids properly it's not going to make the right chemicals it's not going to make the right neurotransmitters so we're, we're real big on supplying the body with the appropriate nutrients neurotransmitter precursors sometimes even hormonal precursors herbs um, as well as vitamins and minerals and amino acids uh, we'll also use uh, but but these are really important if you're going to get somebody's brain working right if it doesn't have the right fuel you can do all the neurofeedback you want all the counseling you want if the fuel is not there if the precursors aren't there nothing's going to work so it's a huge part of our treatment um, well it depends on the person and the problem on our website there's lists of acetylcholine uh, the fish yeah you know the oily fishes salmon herring mackerel all the slimy ones <laughs> ones that I can't stand um, shellfish you know these are good for um, uh, not just uh, acetylcholine um, but the essential fatty acids that are in them, particularly for Northern European fair-skinned people, um, are really essential. Really big, important part of the diet. If you can get ones that, you know, aren't laden with mercury and heavy metals. <music> Electromagnetic pollution is everywhere now. It's a real disaster. Um, uh, we have a friend who, whose job it is to uh, ground buildings and houses that's what he does for a living he goes around and, and puts the grounding wires up and so on and he tells us that every single day it gets worse and worse every time a new laptop is purchased and turned on every time a new cell phone tower goes up every time somebody lights up their cell phone it's a disaster um, these are microwaves these are what we used to cook food so uh, and now with the very refined equipment that we use with neurofeedback you start seeing the stuff it's everywhere it's you know can you hear me now yeah the, the these waves are everywhere so um, it's a big big problem a huge problem um, you know there's different companies out there that create devices in fact there's several of them in this house that clean up some of the pollution but you know you can't live in a Faraday cage but one reason we're up here in the mountains is to get away from this Susan is very sensitive to electrical pollution most people are just don't know it uh, so what can you do well you can shield your house you can buy fairly inexpensive devices that plug into your electrical outlets that clean up the high frequency noise um, but I really if people are really serious about this uh, and and suspect that they're sensitive to electrical pollution that they find somebody to measure their house and their and uh, where they work and so on and make sure they clean it up because it's a huge issue right now and it's it's not going away it's only going to get worse there's a website called lessemf.com and they have a lot of very good devices on there that um, you know, it's not hard to clean up your house. Some of it's expensive, like I want to get the silver paint, but it costs about $300 a gallon. But basically, you paint your walls with it and then you shield your house. Susan's real sensitive to it. We, in fact, that's one of the reasons we had to move out of Atlanta. Because uh, there was a certain time of the day, something happened, enough businesses opened up that were on our power grid, where if you take an AM radio, and turn it all the way 
up to the highest frequency. You'll hear it. And there was this place in our house, remember that? You'd pass the, the, the radio, and it, would, it was unbelievable. It was like there was this line of transmission coming right through the house. And it started about 8.30 in the morning, and then it would go off when the business is closed. Horrible. But it's an easy way to measure it. Just take an AM radio.